All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this annual conference um, of test prep admissions private tutoring professionals. Uh, my name is Marina Grijalva. I uh, own a tutoring company called Mundo Academy based in Los Angeles. Uh, we have a private tutoring side, and then we also have a B2B side in which we partner with nonprofits and with schools and uh, Los Angeles Unified School District. So we have kind of two sides of uh, a tutoring business. Um, I'm a former math and Spanish teacher turned tutor. I was in the classroom for approximately 10 years. Uh, and then my entrepreneurial spirit kind of took over and I would work after school at a tutoring company and decided that uh, that seemed like something that I could do and that I'd be interested in taking on. Uh, so starting in 2008, I've been operating kind of different facets of the tutoring business. Uh, I tutored I worked solo uh, for a few years. Then I made, I had a partnership with a college counselor um, and I founded Mundo Academy in 2018 uh, because I wanted to expand the services so that we would be able to serve underrepresented communities and be able to bring just the support that we offer to our private clients uh, to a broader scale and a bigger population. Um, I am married. Uh, Sorry, we can't see the um, the actual deck, the presentation. Oh, can't. Okay. So we just see the, the the line across the top. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. No, that's no worries. I just thought you might be referring to something on there. Um, you see it now? Oh yeah, yeah. There we go. Perfect. Great. Um. I'm a, I'm married. Uh, my wife and I have three cats uh, named, they have their own Instagram. <laughs> They're called Darwin, Toto, and Nico. Uh, we, I'm an avid supporter of LGBTQ plus rights. Um, I'm a vice president of the board of an organization uh, called the Valley of Change, which tries to um, to fight, which fights for Black Lives Matter movement. It's a Black Lives Matter movement. Um, they protest every single day in the corner, in a corner in Los Angeles ever since uh, the George Floyd incident. So we're working to expand services and uh, make sure that we, again, are helping our community. So uh, I do a lot of work in what's called the Valley of uh, area of Los Angeles, which is uh, north uh, west of the city. Um, so part of Mundo Academy's mission is to create partnerships with schools, school districts, and community-based organizations. When we first started, I started by creating partnerships with community-based organizations just because it was difficult for me to build trust in a community and to have students come to my free sessions or to my test prep uh, boot camps that I would have. Uh, so I figured that a community-based organization would help me reach a broader audience than I personally had within my scope um, of network or within my network. Um, so I started reaching out to different communities um, because then I could bring my expertise to those communities. So essentially nonprofit organizations or schools and underrepresented communities don't have the same level of expertise that we do within the private tutoring sector. So we are well-versed on everything having to do with SAT and ACT and any other tests that we prep for academic. We have a ton of resources that we use for our private clients. And so that's something that we can bring to communities that is not always available. Um, community organizations have grant funds that are dedicated for youth services. So many of these community organizations already offer uh, either tutoring services or homework assistant programs uh, or other type of youth programming leadership, uh, leadership classes um, where you can insert yourself and bring in your expertise where they really need that. Um, and again, because we have special resources that we can provide. As we all know, obviously we've all been affected by the pandemic and uh, learning loss is 
is real. Um, I'm sure we all have seen it within our businesses. Um, and it's especially within public school system, it's something that has really affected them. Uh, at the moment, as you all know, one of the things I'll talk about is that schools have special funding available to them uh, to contract supplemental services, which includes tutoring and after school programming. Um, and so that's something that as private tutoring companies, we can absolutely take advantage of and be able to tap into uh, before the funds run out and then use that as a vehicle to help us create lasting partnerships with these schools so that we can continue working with these communities um, because they really do need the support. Uh, oftentimes, if any of you work within schools, especially public schools now, you know that everybody is overworked within the school system. Uh, they have many students, um, principals have so many tasks to do there's a teacher shortage, there's a substitute teacher shortage. Um, so when it comes to tutoring and intervention programs, although often the schools try to hire their own teachers to either stay after school, come before school or do Saturday school, the reality is that these teachers are too overworked and they are not available during those times. And so then the school doesn't have those resources or these or people manpower to provide intervention and added support to their student body. So uh, I'm gonna talk about LAUSD just because that's where I work. Um, so this is a little bit of numbers from 2021. Uh, I don't have the numbers for 20, the 2021, 2022 school year yet, but this is a little bit of the landscape of the way that so you get an idea of kind of like the needs of students. And usually all school districts are going to publish um, an accountability plan where you'll be able to see what kind, of, what is the trajectory of the student body and who are the students who need it the most. Um, the list of students that we have here, usually these are called target population students. So that's where you want to look to see what target population can you talk, can you, provide services for. Um, for Mundo Academy, our target main target population are English learners. Um, and as you can see, the percentage of students who are English learners that are able to meet A through G requirements is only 12.6% of English learners. Now, an English learner could be a student who was born in the US and perhaps they speak another language at home and they never were able to prove English proficiency through the different exams set forth by the district. And so then they remain within this classification throughout their education. Uh, it, English learners could also be students who are newcomers, which means that they're new to the country and they've been in the country for fewer than three years. And that's how they started. And again, they were never able to show English proficiency. Um, students who exceed college readiness, again, if we look at this, low-income students, only 19.1% of those students are able to exceed college readiness. 0.6% of English learners are college ready, uh, and students with disabilities, 2.5%, foster youth, 9.9%. So these numbers are pretty dire. Uh, you know, and it's only 21.7% of all LAUSD students. So there's a lot of opportunity there. So in terms of uh, the type of funding that you can take advantage of and that you can work towards um, is something called ESSER funds. So it's elementary and secondary school emergency relief funds. So these are funds that would put forth um, for schools and local educational edu agencies so that they can prevent or they can fight learning loss. So as a result of online learning during the pandemic, many students didn't cover enough material uh, during the school year that they were supposed to cover uh, you know, if they were in person school. So it's not so much that teachers didn't teach them is that they didn't teach them perhaps all of the material and skills that they needed to learn. Uh, there's also a lot of social emotional learning that was lost during that time. So there's definitely a lot of funding for that as well. Now, uh, school districts and schools get access to this fund and um, there's 
flexible usage, but there's two kind of there's two main categories where a tutoring company can come in. One is to address learning loss among students. So essentially creating intervention programs within literacy and math to prevent or to help students uh, bridge that gap that they might have had. Um, and then also uh, having supplemental programming. So either summer school or after school programs. Um, at Mundo Academy, we do both. So we address learning loss. Uh, we actually go into schools during the school day. And we also have after school programs. We don't have a summer school program, but we do have several after school programs that we run in partnership with schools. Um, so each state is allotted, allotted a specific amount of ESSER funds. This is a federal fund, so every state has received it. Um, I don't know if I'm able to, I have a PDF document that has a list of how much each state receives um, that I can you know, include in the presentation later. Uh, and schools have until uh, September 2024 to claim these funds and they have to be able to use them by early 2025. So there's still time for us to be able to use these monies. One of the things that in my experience I found is that uh, schools, again, principals are so overworked that sometimes they don't know how to use these funds. They don't know exactly what it is that they need to invest in. So what they end up doing sometimes is hiring our additional teachers, but there's a teacher shortage. So then they can't find people to fill those spots. Um, or again, they plan for intervention programs uh, to be conducted by their own teachers, but then they don't get enough people to sign up. Um, and so then usually principals themselves are allotted a certain amount of school and uh, sorry, a certain amount of money. And then the principal has discretion as, as to how those funds get spent. Um, they spent, the different districts have spent the largest portion on academic interventions, which is again, something that we can provide as private tutoring companies. And they are required to report how they're using these funds, but not necessarily what the success rate is, um, which is something that can set your company apart and that definitely sets us apart because you can do a lot of data tracking, data analysis to show how successful your programs are um, and then show what the value of your company is and what the value of your services is going to be. Um, each state has their own system of reporting the use of funds. So then that's something that you can probably go into your own uh, Department of Education, your State Department of Education, and then see what are those reporting systems and what are those requirements. So um, one of the biggest areas that we have realized that's where students need support is, um, is in literacy. So literacy, especially in elementary school, is a big, huge, area of opportunity for any tutoring company, uh, specifically for students who are in second grade. Uh, students who were in second grade during the pandemic essentially were in kindergarten when the pandemic started. They did first grade online and then um, they went into second grade in person. So these second grade students, if you kind of notice in terms of year by year, uh, this, this graph here is how many of them are percent uh, how many of them are on track to learn how to read? So this is nationwide data uh, for all students who use this program called Amplify, which is a literacy program that many districts use. Uh, they use an exam called Dibbles. Um, so this is based on this literacy skills exam that students take. Um, so as you can see, you know, across the grade level, especially Kindergarten, only 47% of kindergartners were ready or on track to read, 48 are first graders. So these lower grades from kindergarten to third need a lot of support. Um, schools have added more interventions and programs and the districts in themselves have added things in there, but they need more. I mean, the students have a lot of needs. And like I said, especially those target populations, they need a lot of support. Um, and the pandemic has increased the gap in literacy readiness for students of color. So 
uh, black students, uh, Latino students, uh, their those gaps increase the most during this time. So again, the 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 work that needs to be done to bring them up to uh, to grade level is it's very needed. Um, and again, something that you can support. So what are the needs of the schools and what are they looking for? So like I mentioned, literacy, especially K to five is a big area. Math uh, in all grades is uh, a type of tutoring support that they that all schools are going to need. I find that in our experience, we mostly are hired for literacy support and math tends to come second because schools feel that if school, students don't know how to read, how are they going to do math and understand word problems within math? As a math teacher, I cringe at that because I feel like everybody needs to learn numeracy and math. Uh, but that's something that you, know, you can discuss with the schools and bring forth in terms of your programming. Uh, they need a lot of support for English language learners, which is going to be English language development. So essentially English classes, uh, being able to go back, even though a student might be in fifth grade, but teaching them uh, first and second grade reading skills. Uh, newcomers, like I said, those are students who have only been in the country for under three years or from one to three years, um, and AP support. So we found that at high school level, uh, especially when it comes to science, math and sciences, uh, those students need a lot of support for AP exams. So uh, additional tutoring, boot camps, any sort of classes that you can provide to make sure that these students have the skills so that they're able to pass AP exams. Uh, we also do some test prep for state, state exams. In California, students take the Smarter Balance test. So schools have been hiring us to help prepare students for those exams. And so test prep strategies are very similar to you know, the general test prep strategies that we all already teach, uh, just that we're applying it to students who are in lower grades. Um, students in California start taking those tests in third grade and then they take it all the way through high school. Um, remediation, again, uh, helping students bridge that gap between the grade that they're in and uh, excuse me, and what they know. Uh, nobody failed uh, during the pandemic. So students just kept moving on and on. Um, and so then a student might be in third grade, but not even know what their alphabet or letter names and sounds at the most basic level. Um, and then also study skills. Uh, that one I think is a little bit less popular just because all of the other things are so important and so urgent that the study skills can come second fiddle, but we always add them in and integrate them into any of our other programming. So how do you find uh, nonprofits or schools that you can support? One of the things that I recommend is that you research what type of school are schools are in high need areas in your community. In California, there's something called the CENI, which is a student equity uh, index. And so equity needs index. Um, and so then that gives you, that's a map of the city of Los Angeles or any area in California. And it shows you what is the highest need area. The schools that are in highest need area are going to receive the largest amount of funding. Um, and those are the schools usually that are the most overworked and that are going to need your support the most. Uh, so that would be the first step. Identify which are these schools, which are these areas, and then are you able to come into those areas? Are those close to you? Is that, is that an area where you can provide some services? I would also identify community centers or nonprofit organizations that already offer youth services to low-income communities. And uh, again, not just any community center, but make sure that they have a youth program already in place. So do they already do some college readiness or college uh, prep classes? Do they already offer some sort of tutoring? Um, and sometimes it could be that they say that they do, or at least it's, it's uh, on their website, but they might not have a concrete program in place. Uh, so, you know, it's one of those requirements probably of their grant funding, but it usually what I found is that for some organizations, uh, obviously not all of them, but for some, it's not as developed as they would like it to be. 
Um, again, make sure that they offer some sort of college prep. Uh, often they have college counselors or SAT and ACT prep, shorter classes. Um, and I would also recommend religiously affiliated schools. Um, we partner with a couple of uh, Catholic schools where we do HSBT prep. Um, and so we come onto campus, they hire us. Um, and again, the school pays, I mean, the, the students pay the school and then the school pays us and we're able to do it on campus uh, with them. Uh, the HSBT is one of those admission tests that has remained. Uh, ISE has turned a little bit test optional. HSBT uh, seems to still be hanging on. Uh, so we still do some HSBT prep there. So, uh, so some recommendations of things to do before you reach out to any school. So if you're planning to reach out to a public school, the first thing I would recommend is for you to become a vendor with the school district. So whatever school district or what, whatever district the school where you want to create that relationship is in, then become a vendor there. Usually that process isn't very difficult at all. Um, you would need to go online. There's a form that you fill out and you get a vendor number. Um, and that would be the number one main requirement usually that they ask you that you have that you are a vendor approved vendor with the district. Um, one of the things that I would also recommend that you have is that you check district requirements for insurance. Um, so one of the things that I had to do was to make sure that I had uh, general liability insurance uh, that met district requirements, as well as sexual molestation insurance. Um, and so that is something that you want to make sure that you have. I mean, you might have that already uh, as a tutoring company, but the districts will usually definitely recommend that you have that. Um, and then identify the school's pain so or the organization that you're reaching out. So what do you feel like they're going to need the most help with? And then how can you uh, support them? Are you going to provide supplemental services? Are you going to offer new services or do you want to take over a current service? So what is it that what value are you going to bring to them uh, as you uh, give your value proposition and reach out to them, what is your goal in terms of how are you going to support this organization, their community, and uh, their students. Um, so have that clear so that when you reach out to them, you know what it is that you are uh, discussing and that you have a clear idea of what your the community where you're where you want to insert yourself and that you're able to talk to them about their needs expertly. Of course, you never want to make any assumptions about what they need. So you always want to make sure that you listen very carefully and that you do your research well. So talk to people in the community, make sure that you understand what is happening there. Identify decision makers. So um, with public schools, it's usually going to be the principal uh, with a nonprofit organization. It might be the executive director, but sometimes there could be other people who can help. Um, so, for example, a lot of private schools have a target population specialist. Uh, they call it like a TSP advisor, target population specialist. Um, and so those those uh, people are in charge of providing services to the target populations that we talked about previously. So that would be a good person to reach out to and to say, hey, I can offer these services to these students. Um, is there somebody who you know within these schools? Do you have somebody who can introduce you to a principal or to an executive director or to a college counselor uh, or the person who directs a college uh, program? In, their, in the community center, um, have them introduce you and tell them a little bit about you. Um, learn the lingo and learn what it is that the schools are looking for and discussing as much as you can. If you're able to, again, have somebody to, who talks to you about what do they call their after-school programs? Like, what do they call 
what tests do the students take? What are the state test exam, exams that they're taking? What literacy programs are they using? Learn all of those different components so that when you speak to them, you're able to use that same lingo and talk to them in a way that makes sense uh, to them. Um, one of the things that I did to start was I offered freebies uh, to build trust. So I would approach a nonprofit organization. I would say, hey, I know that you offer uh, SAT prep uh, already to your, you know, the students in your college program. Can I offer a free boot camp on a Saturday for three hours uh, at your community center and we can open it to the community as a whole? Um, and that proved to be very valuable to me because then I kept uh, those, the numbers for those kept growing. And then eventually the nonprofit organization hired me to do all of their test prep. And so we do online test prep, we do uh, practice tests, we do review sessions. And so we're able to, we were able to build our relationship with nonprofits in that way. Um, and uh, like I said, uh, make it as easy as possible. So whenever you do start working with let's say, principals in a nonprofit, make it as easy for them uh, to onboard with you. So you can take care of the advertising, making the flyers of, you know, spreading the word far and wide that, of what you're doing. Um, because they would be providing you with, let's say, a space or with their community and with the trust that comes with their name. And so then as you start building that, then the more and more that the community will start trusting you and the more that you're going to be able to provide more services uh, to them. So... After you make that connection and after a school or a nonprofit decides that they do want to partner with you, um, in the schools, usually you'll have to find, you'll need to sign a, a contract of some sort. But again, I found that principals have a lot of discretion in how they use these funds. If they're spending under a certain amount uh, on your company, they don't have to go through the school district for approval. So in the Los Angeles School District, if they are hiring for under $25,000 per program at a time, then they don't have to go through the school district for approval. They don't have to go through procurement. They can just hire you directly. And it's not $25,000 total, it's $25,000 per invoice. So you can split that up into multiple invoices and provide services um, for half semesters and then, you know, and, and use up whatever funds that they decide that they're going to invest in your company. Um, so learn, you know, ask those kind of questions to your principal so that you know, okay, how does this work? And then is there a limit? Uh, sometimes the principals themselves don't know. So then if there's, if you know somebody who can help you with that information, the better. Um, make sure that you measure results. That's going to be extremely important for you to keep track of your data. How are your students doing? Do pre-tests and post-tests. Progress monitor your students at different intervals so that you're constantly showing how they're growing and that their skills are improving. Make sure that you create a report for the principals for them to be able to, and again, this is a way that you're making it easier for them because now with your report, they're going to be able to show that they were able to, that they successfully invested these ESSER funds. Um, and so then how they made use of them and how they were able to improve their schools, their um, students' academic achievement. Um, anytime that I had older students, with younger students, it's a little bit more difficult, but with middle school students and high school students, always survey them as well so that they can talk about the strengths of your program and you can use their own voice in their report and be able to talk about how much students enjoyed your classes or uh, your tutors or your programming overall. Make sure that you're transparent with your pricing. Um, again, in the trying to make everything as easy as possible. Make sure that schools know and nonprofits know what exactly they're getting for the price that they're going to pay. So, uh, and what it is that you expect them to pay for. So uh, for us, we 
do re we do request some materials from the schools that's part of our pricing uh, we do request access to certain data and information and those are all things that we are transparent about and that we ask for to begin with so um, does the school do you want the school to provide you with all testing information for the students in your programming uh, how do you want the students to be chosen who are going to participate in your program uh, what are the requirements and who's going to choose the students or is the teacher going to choose the students is the principal going to choose the students are you going to say which students you're going to work with um, so those are all things that you need to sort out and think about and price all of those aspects accordingly. Um, and then highlight, make sure you highlight the areas where you can continue to help. So let's say you do uh, a tutoring program that's after school and you notice that there's something else that students need support in, is that something additional that you can provide? And so make sure that the schools know the scope of everything that you can do because once again once you're in and they trust you then they might hire you to do another type of support and work so we uh partner with two major uh nonprofits in the los angeles area puente learning center and barrio action um we're also los angeles school district is divided into smaller districts and then those districts are divided into smaller communities of schools um, so we are a community partner for the monroe community of schools which is um, a set of about 20 elementary schools middle school and high school um, and we offer tutoring services to eight of the elementary schools in the monroe community of schools and next year we've expanded that uh, we've actually expanded outside of the Monroe Community of Schools and are offering services to 16 schools within the Los Angeles School District. So in one year, we were able to, well, we started with two schools in Monroe. Last year, we did, had eight, and then next year, we will have 16. So we were able to have extraordinary growth, again, because of our partnership with the schools. And once you make that connection and you're able to talk with principals and they build trust with you uh, they recommend you to other uh, principals in the area um, and again they need to spend this money like they they really need to spend it and so then they need to and they need these services for their students as well uh, so you are very very much in need and in demand uh, so it's a matter of being able to make those connections and being able to show that you can provide the services that they need um, and that's all